Coming up, a FastPass Plus loophole is closed. We express our discontent with the cupcake fad. We share our unpopular Disney World opinions. And in the main segment, we discuss how many days are needed for a Disney World trip. All that and more on this episode of WDW Opinion. Cue the music. To all who come to this happy place, welcome. This is the podcast where two friends, Connor. You are a child's play thing. And Hank. You are a sad, strange little man. Can you have my pity? Share their opinions, tips, and stories about anything and everything at Walt Disney World. Just go on. Get ready, because this is WDW Opinion. We're in the tower. We are ready for takeoff. Hello and welcome to episode number 29 of WDW Opinion, the podcast where friends talk Disney. We share our Disney World opinions so that you can start planning for and daydreaming about your next perfect Disney vacation. We share our opinions with our blog, podcast, weekly Facebook live streams every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern, and more. Join the Disney Opinion conversation by following us on social media where we are at WDW Opinion, and visit WDWOpinion.com to check out our blog posts on all things Disney and to see what we're up to in between episodes. There you can also get a free Disney trip planning checklist when you sign up for our weekly email newsletter. I'm your host, Carter Brown, and I'm joined by my co-host and Disney partner in crime, Mr. Hank Molsky. Hank, to the surprise of no one, my New England Patriots won the Super Bowl <laughs> yet again, and they celebrated the best way possible by heading to Walt Disney World. How great is that? Did Connor, did you hear that? What? I think that was more than half of our audience just dropping off right there when they found out you were oh, a Oh, more fan. than half. Oh, wow. That was a big jump from what yeah. we workshopped. Um <laughs> I understand people hate the Patriots. That's fine, but I think they should have some. Uh, they should be happy for me. Uh, they haven't won a whole lot in recent. <laughs> I I don't think Boston wins sports things at all. It's ever. been ninety three days since the last championship uh, from wow. when the Patriots won until uh, the Red Sox won this year. It was a bit, bit of a drought. Bit of a drought. Um, but did you know, the Red Sox win the World Series this yes, year yes, too? They did. Good God, um, man! What the hell? But you know. Share the love. I, it's for me. Obviously, I love the Patriots, but I just love that commercial, regardless, oh, just because of how much you. I love Disney World. You know, Tom Brady and Julian Edelman. You just won the Super Bowl. What are you gonna do next? We're going to Disney World. It, yeah, it's an iconic line. Easy, easy thing that you think Connor would send me the next morning. Look, it's the Patriots. They're going to Disney World. Guess what? tables turned i sent it to connor because it's a great commercial and everyone has to love it yep win or lose i mean obviously if you're on the receiving end if you're the, an la rams fan yeah, if you're the one guy right. out there i'm sorry about that um, one la rams the fan. One sorry LA, yeah 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 um so we were talking about this and how great the commercial is and stuff but i said to hank have i ever told you my super bowl parade story at disney world and he said no and i said I got to save it for the podcast. So back in um, 2015, February of 2015, I was in college. My aunt and my, my cousin were down at Disney World for a um, dance competition that my cousin was participating in. They invited my mom. My mom said, hey, Connor, if you want to come, we're going to be here this week. You know, fly down from college, meet us there. I said, absolutely. It was great because I was able to like, basically lead the their team like around like none of them had ever been so i helped them out a lot uh it was a blast but the caveat was on sunday it was the super bowl and the patriots were playing the seattle seahawks Mm -hmm. and my mom and i were like no matter where we are we got to go back to the hotel we got to watch that game so in the morning we went to like animal kingdom then we came back we sat, we watched the game. It was absolutely incredible. It came down to the very, very end when the Seahawks were on like the one or two yard line, about to score, about to win the game in the final seconds of the fourth quarter when Malcolm Butler of the Patriots intercepted <laughs> a pass on the goal line from Russell Wilson. It was absolutely in- incredible. We went crazy. At that point when we won, my mom turned to me and said, 
Our flights are tomorrow. I have to go back for work. You can extend yours a day so that you can go to Magic Kingdom and watch the parade. Because mm. what are you going to do next? We're going to Disney World. So I was was like, it Malcolm Butler? Who was the MVP? So it was, Mal- I think Malcolm Butler got it. And then Julian Edelman was was also sent. So That guy just guys. loves Disney. Good guy. Exactly. So I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. I can't wait. And I'm, I changed the flight and then I'm frantically looking like, okay, when are they going to schedule it? Is it going to be the three o'clock? Is it parade at Magic Kingdom? Is it going to be like at two o'clock and then they do the parade? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? Frantically checking, you know, Twitter, all this stuff for news, for updates. And then I'm thinking, oh my God, what if they don't go (laughs) to Disney World? What if they go to Disneyland? And I'm like, there's no possible way because... The game was in New Orleans. I'm like, it makes so much more sense to go from to New Orleans to Orlando, Orlando back up to Boston for the parade. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. And on top of that, Hank, do you remember this a few years ago when this was going on? The measles outbreak that was happening in Disneyland? Yes, I do remember that. This was a big deal, like hundreds of or people were infected or stuff like that. Like yeah, there was an outbreak forgot about that. of measles at Disneyland. It was almost on lockdown. I'm like, they can't go out there. Sure enough, like noon rolls around at Disney World, and I'm like, they're, they're not coming here. They went all the way out to L.A. for no reason at all. Oh, boy. I, we, we could do another whole rant session on this, but that is ridiculous. <laughs> it's almost like... And I don't know if it's something I'm where, going to Disneyland. That's not what you say. And it's I don't know if it's like if it's something where they change every other year cuz I always thought it it wasn't like that. It was literally the first time I had seen them go to Disneyland in yeah. in my lifetime. This year they announced it before they said if the Rams win, they're going to Disneyland. That makes total sense. Yeah, this is the first cool. time an LA team has been in, and God knows how long. But if the Patriots win, they are going to Disney World. Yeah, um, I was devastated. Yeah, I, I did get an extra Disney day though, so that's not bad. But <laughs> nothing wrong with that. That is a pretty nothing crazy. wrong with an extra Disney day. Hey, we'll we'll give you a little more info later on uh, how to uh, how to manage one of those extra days. That's right. That's right. So you know, the Patriots win. Maybe someday I'll get to see them marching down Main Street, USA. But. Uh, That'll have to wait. They'll have to wait because now it's time for News to Opinion. This is our weekly segment where we each pick a recent Disney news story to discuss and share our thoughts and opinions on. My Disney news story of the week is that Fast Pass reservations will be deleted upon Walt Disney World Resort hotel reservation cancellation to stop guest abuse. So I talked about this story last night on the or on the last um, Facebook live show. We do a Facebook live show every Tuesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. Tune in to chat with us in real time every Tuesday night. Facebook.com slash WDW opinion. But this is coming from WDW News Today. According to internal sources, Disney plans to remove any fast pass reservations created with a then canceled resort reservation. This fixes a loophole in the FastPass system where a guest could book a Walt Disney World Resort hotel reservation to take advantage of the 60-day advanced FastPass booking window and subs- subs- subsequently, is that a real word? Subsequently? Really? Sub- subsequently. That, yeah. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and just say it's not a word. Okay. We don't subscribe to believing that word's real on no, this no, podcast. No, no, no. So, the, so let me just explain this by, by myself. If you stay at an on-site resort, a Disney-owned resort, you get to book FastPass Plus 60 days in advance. Everyone else, if they're staying off property, if they're annual pass and they don't have a resort reservation anywhere, they book 30 days in advance. That extra 30 days that you get at the 60-day through the 30-day mark means the world. It, you get a lot of benefits. You can almost guarantee that you're going to get top rides, um, depending on your length of stay and stuff like that. But... What this was doing is people were booking a stay at a Disney World hotel, booking their fast passes at the 60-day mark, and then canceling their hotel reservations, 
but their fast passes were staying with them. If you cancel mm-hmm. your reservation, what is it, Hank? It's up to like two weeks before you get a hundred percent of your money back. I think. I, I Connor, I think it's like twenty four hours. It, it might be more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty. You can take it right up to the eleventh hour so, and not cancel, yeah. or, and then cancel, and then cancel. So this loophole. Granted, if you booked sixty days in advance and then you booked. 30 day or you canceled 30 days or more before so like 30 31 32 33 those fast passes were already gone they were immediately canceled for years it was in that window of 30 days out if you canceled in between then and your stay they remained on your my disney experience i think this is a loophole that i'm sure people took advantage of um we kind of did in a roundabout way. I think yeah. there's a very minorly. <laughs> I think there's a small minority that um, actually used this to to like go on rides, like book a hotel to yeah. get this specifically so that they could get these fast passes at this day. I think what it really was was people for whatever reason had an emergency or something that cancel they canceled their hotel stay and those. Fast Pass Plus reservations basically just stayed in limbo. You know, they didn't hmm. cancel them yeah. because they were they were done. Disney couldn't go out and pull them back in, so they just weren't being used. And that kind of hurts the system because it means they can't be put back into the pool for someone who's actually going to be there uh, to get. Hank, what was our kind of experience with this this loophole? We so we I spoke to a couple of Disney agents about it because we booked through Disney's primary booking site one time to go down there. And did that more than 60 days out, or not more than 60, in the 60-day window to book rides, uh, book rides and attractions. And we um, found a better deal on Priceline for the same hotel. So I was nervous about switching my reservation from one to the other. And I was kind of like sitting on it a little bit. I wanted to cancel the Disney one. And so basically I just asked someone like, Hey, by the way, if I cancel my Disney one and go for something on Priceline, will I lose them? And she's like, actually, you won't lose them at all. You won't lose these fast passes, period. They're yours now because you had a hotel booking. I was like, oh, great. I'll cancel this right away. Canceled. Eventually made another on-property reservation through Priceline. So it those paired up. And she said sometimes that can take three to four days for fast passes to pair up to third party provider reservation on the website. So I may have just held on to the reservation longer had I not, you know, had this rule been in place. But um yeah, we wouldn't have had to book up on property again. We did, and they eventually synced up to that, so we wouldn't have lost them in this scenario unless they dropped off like right away after we canceled that one. So And we were go. we were gonna book on property regardless, because that's where we wanted yeah. to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were just in the cost saving um perspective. You know, if the, we kept we were guaranteed that we were gonna keep the fast pass plus reservations. We were gonna be be stupid yep. not to get that extra money back in our pocket. I think at the end of the day this is this is good, but I don't expect it to make a big impact. I don't know. Think- it's a it's a minor adjustment, but that's one of those things. It's just like yeah, yeah, patch the hole, whatever. Exactly, exactly. That shouldn't be that shouldn't be a thing that I'm allowed to do anyways. No, fix the leak, and it, because the system is so ex- advanced and expansive and, and intricate, you're gonna get these little things that pop up that is gonna take a yeah. while to fix because it's just unforeseen. You can't launch a system like this. Yeah. And expect to have everything fixed. Expect to, on launch, you know, which was, God, probably five years ago, something like that, have it be perfect from the get-go. Like, this is yeah. bound to have these little quirks and things like that. Disney's being proactive in the last couple of years with, you know, um, giving people these these notices and, and things like that. Uh, two, yeah, two quick things. I did not know, Connor, I don't know if you saw this bubble up in the Disney fan community afterwards was not familiar with this other loophole that people are quite fond of now this is for some serious cost saving interesting type of spenders uh maybe more isolated to like large groups there is still a loophole out there where you can book a like a campsite for like one night way long out get the 60 day window thing 
sync those to fast pass uh sync those fast pass reservations keep it pay for that room for whatever nominal fee it's still not nominal it's pretty expensive to still do that and then if you're staying off can like you know off-site with a whole bunch of people in a big room where you're saving tons of money, uh, people still use that loophole to book fast passes that way. So you basically have the smallest, you have a campsite, which comes yeah. in for like 40 bucks a night or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're basically just paying like a fee to be able to book a little bit further out. But the thing that that scares me is there's no way I don't think for Disney to track that other than going yeah. to the campsite and saying like these people aren't here let's see if they actually use their fast passes yeah right because that just means that people are willing to put that premium on yeah like paying for fast passes yeah which I think inevitably there's going it's to be a some form very of very small yeah very small faction of people also my second thing was the word you were looking at was uh subsequently it did look strange in the type in the in the text okay thank you very much thank you for <laughs> bringing that up i'm glad we we're, were able to sleep tonight because uh, i typed subsequently and it was like did you mean subsequently and i was like well yes i did yes yes great great i'm an idiot i'm a big dum dum. good 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 <laughs> all right well that's the look- news from my end hank what's your news story of the week uh, slow news week, Connor. Review from uh, WDW News Today. Uh, breaking news, folks, at Disney World. New Lion King Cupcake debuts at Pizza Fari <laughs> in Disney's Animal Kingdom. <laughs> Hang on, let me read this one for you, folks. There's a new cupcake in town, and this time it's all about the king. In honor Ugh. of the 25th anniversary of the Lion King, Animal Kingdom has debuted a new Simba Cupcake, and it's going to be the... No. Main event no. for sure. M A N E. The Lion King inspired cupcake is available at Pizza Safari. The sign by the register sounds like a description I would have written. Oh, okay, this is very editorialized. What? I guess that's better than some of the mysterious cupcakes I've ordered recently. Either way, the signs promise a yummy white chocolate mousse and an adorable edible image. I definitely agree. It's adorable. Let's hope the yummy part is accurate as well. Was, I'm not going to get it. I'm not reading the rest of this review. What was the name of that, um, that author? Uh, this would be by Annie Wilson. Okay, Annie, Annie. if you listen. Okay, I, I did laugh at the main event. That was Annie. Amazing. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you okay, <laughs> Annie? Um, there's a violent transition from a, a topical or just a news story to editorialized, but we made it through. It is basically a news story. There's a new cupcake. It's a it, that is a news story, my friend. Um, I'm looking through some of the photos of this very not appetizing piece of bread with some laminated icing on top of it. Um, it's very yellow. It looks kind of like one of those VHS types. Yellow. I, I, I've watched the VHS of The Lion King like 45 times. That's the color of the Simba uh, that uh, the yeah. cupcake is. You know, the, the film's wearing down. I don't really know if that was a good joke. That wasn't a good joke. I didn't really understand where you're going for. I don't know what I was going with there. I thought you were talking do about, we, like, the actual VHS do VHS Do VHSs lose their color over time? Like No, like, every once in a while you'd get, like, a white one or all yeah. Nickelodeon ones were no, orange. No, not like that. I'm talking about, like, the actual film inside the VHS tape. Yeah, dude, I have no idea. Yeah, that was stupid. My mom Anyways, always it's told a me dumb to yellow that. color. I, I ruined it's the film. It's a dumb yellow color. Uh, <laughs> oh boy, really yeah. Uh, it see, it I'm just all out of sorts because of this. This cupcake news has got me so, um, so excited to go back to Magic or Animal Kingdom and try this thing out. Connor, what about you? Um, I no, <laughs> not really. I have some pretty strong opinions about the cupcake fad, and they start with why is this still a thing. I yeah. think cupcakes are, I think they're more decorative than they are tasty. Um, if anyone watches, I don't even know, I think it's called DC Cup. I don't even know what the, the name of the show on TLC is, but it's about Georgetown Cupcake. <laughs> so there's Georgetown Cupcake. Like I live in DC. There's one like right down the street from my house. Um, people bring it in all the time. I think they're just so overpriced. They don't actually taste that good. I mean, I'll eat an entire one. Are they really sweet? Yes, they like pa- pack like a pound of icing on. That's the issue I've got with sprinkles. Yes, exactly. It's the same way. And I think, you know, at Disney, you, you have sprinkles cupcakes. You have all these other places that have like nine different, you know, celebratory 
cupcakes or whatever for every yeah, I mean, 25th anniversary you can think of. I'm ready for the donut fad. There's already a couple of them popping up. I need donuts to be everywhere. You got donut ears now. Connor. You got the That's sushi easy. donut over at, uh, oh, geez. you know. Okay, help, help me out. There was a donut pop-up. Did you see that at Disney World? Where all yeah, I saw it. That was stupid, but I mean, I want you know. <laughs> yes, it, unique, yes, it was unique Disney you know donut. What, Connor, there's nothing wrong with a good old fashioned white and chocolate vanilla Mickey ice cream bar. What's wrong with that? That's Instagrammable. It's iconic. It's not overdone, and it just tastes good. It's two flavors, and it's not laminated. It's in the shape of a Mickey, and you know. We reported on this uh, uh, about a month ago. They're starting to make their way to uh, uh, grocery stores to celebrate yeah. Mickey's 90th anniversary. Yeah, so, they are in stores. His 90th birthday. I gotta get a Mickey waffle maker. That's my. That's a, the next uh, Disney food item purchase that I need for the home. They did announce. I just saw a photo of a rice crispy treat in the Magic Kingdom that looks like a Mickey premium ice cream bar. Did you see that? But it looks yeah. like there was a bite taken out of it. Oh, okay. See, that's kind of clever. And so it looks a big rice crispy guy. It looks like the uh, it looks like uh, uh, the ice cream is melting a little, but it's really just oh, chocolate, okay. or it's really just yep. marshmallow dripping like that. Yeah, see, that's clever. Not not something that I really want to eat, but I got you. There you go. All right. When you realize that your Fast Pass Plus reservations were canceled, you can wash your you can wash your tears down with a nice cupcake at Pizza Fari to celebrate the Lion King. Big news, big news. Big news week. Big news week. Now it's time for our middle segment. We all have our favorite Disney park, Disney attractions, and Disney restaurants, and they are our favorite for a plethora of reasons. But then there are other things that we are supposed to like, or supposed to hate, because the vast majority of the Disney fan community thinks that way. Well, in this segment, we'll share our unpopular Disney opinions in a safe, welcoming, judge-free space. Psych, we're going to probably judge each other so hard, but we'll have fun doing it. So, Hank, what's your unpopular Disney opinion this week? And let's focus on Animal Kingdom attractions. The, the Animal we? Kingdom round. Um, Connor, I've been thinking about this one. I've said it on the podcast before, and I think I'm just going to go ahead and I'm, I'm going to throw it out there just for this week because it changes all the time. Any true Disney fan likes to power rank their parks. Boom. We've done it since the age, it, it, since the beginning of time. Um, since the fourth gate opened, you gotta rank them. You, you rank them all the time. And much like the rises and falls of the NFL power rankings or whatever sport you want to insert, you see the little red and green arrows tick up and down for arbitrary reasons every single week. <laughs> which we do the same to the parks. Yeah. Oh, my number one right now is this. But, um, kind of there's always been one for me that I like to hover in the one or two spot that a lot of people don't. And you know what? Just for the hell of it tonight, I'm gonna say, it, it dropped into number one, my favorite park, Animal Kingdom. For and just like, to, like attractions in general? I love Animal Kingdom, man. And this is what I'm talking about. It is my – it is a love song to Joe Rody. It is an ode to the Joe Rody story at Walt Disney World. If, if there is a park that encapsulates Walt Disney, Magic Kingdom, or Disneyland – this one sings Joe Rody, and it is such a cool piece of storytelling to me. Wow. And I don't I just don't think any other park anywhere in well, maybe Disney Sea, of course. Yeah. Always the exception. There's no park that quite holds on to this story of the Animal Kingdom. Sure. This this these different planets that you can travel to or different lands and experience the culture and the environment of them in a way that Animal Kingdom has managed to maintain since the mid 90s now. We're rolling through two decades of it and they haven't they haven't quite uh, given up because Hollywood Studios had given up on its uh, its dream about a decade in. Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways they are all kind of 
flawed from the get-go. Like, there's no way yeah. you can have an entire theme park established for a number of years over the course. But I think Animal Kingdom was the one that's stuck to it the most. Magic Kingdom is built on being able to be ever-changing, right? That's why yeah, the absolutely. lands are so overarching. That's why it's you know? often num- people's number ones, including my own. Anything can go in Adventureland. Anything can go in Frontierland. Anything can go in Tomorrowland. You know, there's plenty of places like, we have this ride right here. Where can we make it fit? Yep. Hollywood Studios was difficult because once they started adding in more rides, it took away from it being behind the scenes to being in the movies. Epcot right. was a unique thing where the entire front of the park was doomed from the day it opened because <laughs> it's a future world, not like Tomorrowland, um, but Tomorrowland has these same issues. It's about the future, but the products could never keep up. You know, they never realized yeah. that technology was going to advance so much. But Animal Kingdom, you're right, Hank, in is has been truly centralized in their appreciation of animals. Everything yeah. is surrounding animals, whether it's um, real life, endangered, extinct, or mythical. And the overarching thing is humans' relationship with those animals. That's why you when go. you go yeah. to Ananampur in um, Asia, everything is about the beast in the mountain, the birds there. In Africa, it's about the Kilimanjaro uh, the Harambe Wildlife Reserve. Right. Preservation. It's your interaction with them. And, and Pandora, colon, the world of Avatar. Mm-hmm. It's about how humans went there and kind of just mined, had bad mining practices, the RDA, and infiltrated the Navi, the the animals there and the banshees. The Ekron, the mighty Ekrons. There you go. So I think in that regard, it has stuck to its theme perfectly and it yeah was and even with the rumors of a zootopia expansion coming you know someday eventually that fits you know it you know it's crazy hank that you actually bring that up because joe Rody, who's the you know one of the leading um uh imagineers at uh disney imagineering and, and you know, the driving force behind animal kingdom it's really his baby the driving force behind Uh-oh. so many other places. He had this very, very long Instagram post today. And it was a shot of, um, or actually I guess it was a couple days ago. It was a shot of Main Street USA. And he says, continuing on themed entertainment. So this is kind of like a series he's doing. Let's focus on the word theme. Perhaps Ooh, the most okay, a- like important aspect of a themed environment. This concept is often misrepresented as meaning decorated to look like something like this drink stand is decorated is or this drink stand is themed to look like a cottage. This is poor English and poor design theory. The word theme, which is in the dictionary, refers to the deep binding idea that brings unity to a creative work. It goes on for many, many more paragraphs, but I think that's perfect. The deep unity wow. yeah, that's that really ties cool. everything together. That and only Joe Rody gets away with that type of stuff. Exactly. Right? <laughs> that theme in Animal Kingdom speaks more so than any of the other theme parks here yes. domestically, for sure. Hank, I love that unpopular Disney yeah. opinion. Cause and like is. I said, I, tomorrow the, the rankings, you'll have to check my uh, power rankings. Uh, I'll post those on Twitter or something. Yeah, can you? Uh, they, they could change by tomorrow. But Magic Kingdom will probably be number one that, again. That, but still saying, I Animal Kingdom is always hovered in that number two spot for me. There's something about, I don't mind the distances between rides. I love how quiet it is in certain areas. I, I, it's just the park for me. I, I like it. You have always been a big animal kingdom guy even pre like pandora Uh, and stuff like that which is great um all right for me i've shared an unpopular disney opinion about animal kingdom before about how i don't really like the festival of the lion king i think it's okay but for this one i'm focusing on an actual attraction and that's something i do like that i think recently has been getting a lot of flack and I actually really like It's Tough to Be a Bug. Yeah, yeah all right. Okay. But let me hear it. I think it's one of these rides or attractions, shows, what have you, that now routinely has like a five, ten minute wait. 
And I don't know yeah. if it's because 3D films are just on the decline, like the Muppet Vision is that same way. Um, yeah. Mickey's Philhar Magic is that same way. There's no real um, Honey, honey I Shrunk the Kids. Keep going, though. Uh, or, you know, or, or, or whatever anymore. But um, I think for that attraction, it it sticks to the theming so well. Like, oh, you yeah. feel like you're a bug. You're in the tree of life. I think that in a, of itself is remarkable. How yeah. you exit and you exit through the, you know, the, like the forest, the roots of the tree, how you walk through and you can feel the tree and you can feel the sculptures on it. I think it's incredible that they thought, hey, let's put a show building inside that. Let's put a Yeah, it is inside. really remarkable. And I, I often think about that too. And you don't hear people talk about it too, too often as something like, oh, they got to change this. They got to cycle something out. I don't see that a lot. Obviously, it comes up from time to time, but that's not like a, a growing movement among, you know, fans or Disney Imagineers. And it's part of what you're saying, like, there is when you just look at the complete show set as, you know, all of a sudden, this giant tree, you're under it. You immediately feel you know, overwhelmed by the size of it because you're the size of a bug when you're down at that level. And just the way that you enter through the show building and you're way in these caverns, kind of, I don't know what they could do down there that would, you know, really fit the theming as well as it's tough to be a bug. I think it's one of those things that can kind of go beyond its movie because of all the Pixar movies, it's one of the most forgettable, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah. They're like, yeah. oh, yeah, partially because it came out around the same time as Ants, so people always get confused by that. Right. But this attraction actually opened before the Pixar film came out. Fun fact. Did not, I don't think I knew that. Just a few months, I believe. But um, So that's cool. And I think the special effects for it was pretty much an opening day attraction, from what I remember, were... They hold up pretty well, you know. Twenty Hopper's years. Hopper's not a bad animatronic. Hopper's an incredible animatronic in it. It fills the room with with smoke at one point, and you're like, mm-hmm. I can't see anything. Those tarantulas that come down from the ceiling. The, um, I guess it could use a new screen and maybe some new technology yeah, behind that. Yeah, that's what it could use. But I think the story's clever. It's funny. It you know, it's in your face like any 3D film should be. Um, yeah. So I, like I think, it. I think the I think the issue with the wait time is you've got this gentle blur of a, a dated ride. Not saying out of date, just dated, a dated ride in the park uh, or a dated attraction, um, mixed with the fact that it's for a younger audience. But it's pretty damn scary. And it scares the crap out of that younger <laughs> it's audience. It's pretty damn scary it for the younger audience scary. that it's targeting. You know, I mean, that's, I, there is, it is a rite of passage to go in there and just hear the screaming children when those spiders start to drop. Oh, yeah. Really, when anything starts, they start screaming. Yeah, yeah I mean, that ride is your guaranteed tears mm-hmm. every time. Now, we pretty much said the entire attraction, but I'm going to say a spoiler alert now. The point where the yellow jackets come and they stab you in the back. The one it first happened to me when I was a kid. I hated oh, it so much, and I never forgot. So never I put my seat against that back. I again. always lean forward, and I haven't been stung since. <laughs> I haven't been stung since, but you always remain seated, so the uh, the other viewers in the audience can exit first. Ex- correct? Ex- yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course. Good, good, good. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's a good one. I try to I, say no to I try to ruin everyone's day as much as possible. Yes. When they tell me to move all the way to the end, I plot my butt right in the middle, <laughs> right in the middle. Yeah. I try to yeah, latch onto a family and get in between them. So mom and dad are on one uh, side of me, brother and sister on the other. So there you go. Hank thinks it's the best <laughs> Disney theme park there in Orlando today, that's at least. I think It's Tough to Be a Bug has been getting a bad rap. I think it's a pretty good attraction. Those are our unpopular Disney opinions for Animal Kingdom.
37 square miles. That's twice the size of the island of Manhattan. It's also the size of Walt Disney World property. Now, currently only a third of the lat land is actually developed, but that still leaves quite a vast expanse to explore. Home to four theme parks, two water parks, over 20 resort hotels, the gigantic Disney Springs shopping, dining, and entertainment district, and so much more, there's plenty to see and do at Walt Disney World. Listen, there's simply no way to see and do it all in any one trip to Disney World. It doesn't matter how long you stay either. Take it from me. I lived there for a year, and in the years when I haven't lived there, I've made nearly 30 separate trips to the House of the Mouse. And there are still plenty of things I haven't ever seen or experienced. It's not shocking that one of the most frequent questions I get asked by people is how many days should we go to Disney World? What they actually mean when they ask that is how many days does it take to see and do it all? That question is impossible to answer. So what's the perfect amount of days for a Disney trip? Well, that question too is unanswerable. There's no uniform, this is how many days you should go. Each person is different, and because of this, there's no one-size-fits-all trip. Your budget, how many days you can be away from home and work, and what you're looking to get out of the experience will determine what kind of trip you will have. For this segment, rather than Hank and I just giving you one answer, we're going to break it down by days. We're going to give you 30. We're going to give you 40. We'll tell you what to do with one, two, three, four, and all the way up to seven days. Along the way, we will share the best itineraries for each amount of days, and we'll end up at a conclusion of what we might recommend date-wise for trips. So Hank, it, do it. it really comes down to who's going on the trip, right? I think yeah. when it comes to like first-timers, that's who generally asks this question, because everyone is all about doing as much as possible and they always are under the assumption that one day isn't enough. And if this is your once in a lifetime trip, I'll agree with you, one day probably isn't enough. You probably wanna go as many days as possible. But I think new timers are turned off by simply one or two day trips. Do you think this is a good option for first timers or should they always go big or go home? It's a, again, it's not always a one size fits all for me. Sometimes if you've got someone that is really going to commit to a day or two, I think that can be a first-time trip. I really do. But if you're on a business trip and you've got time and you want to go check out the parks for the first time, that's when I start to go, just, you know what, let's let's plan something a little bit different for you this time around. Because not sure if trying to cram in Disney to your other trip is going to be the right fit. So if you fully commit I think one or two days might be able to work. You want to give people the benefit of the doubt, obviously, that, yeah, yeah, you could go for a couple hours. But I think our problem is because we love it so much, we want someone to truly experience it so that they do end up loving it. I don't want anyone to go and hate it. If they do, fine, that means less people in the park. I (laughs) do want them to go and love it. And I think so many people are like, "I I don't want to do just one day or two day. I want to go big. You can have a great time one day or two day. Yeah, you can definitely. experience a lot and it's a great appetizer almost. Yeah. And it's not like an appetizer like you're not getting the same amount of fun. You are. Yeah. It's just a good entry into maybe bigger dates down or bigger stays down the road. Yeah. So I would like to add, Connor, before we go into like a one day, kind of what we'd recommend, I'd like to add that kind of half day experience because I've believe it or not I've had two friends or family in less than the past, like past less than a year let's say that you know look for recommendations on what to do for you know what I've got half a day and I want to check out Disney World which by default they think they're talking about the Magic Kingdom right 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 we can't stress that enough Harry Potter World there's, gotcha like you said there's 47 square miles of this space that you really got to dig into mm-hmm. But um, I, I think this is where it's important to know, like, how many hours are you going to get out of a park? Because you really are. There is no shortcutting away of how much you're going to pay to enter a park nowadays. 
have had people ask, can I go in just for a few hours after four or after five? Yeah, but it's going to cost the same price as a full price ticket. And if you're going during the winter time, parks are going to close earlier in the day. If you're going to the summertime, you might have a lot of hours where you can get into the park. But um, here's the thing that I don't ever want to scare people away. If you're in Florida or if you're in Orlando and you want to experience a tiny taste of that Disney magic, find a way to get on the resort loop, on the monorail. Go check out the resorts on property. We talked about this the last episode. Get over to Disney Springs. You can get that half-day experience before you even meet the one-day requirement, which we're going to talk about. I think that's the main appeal of why people choose to stay at Disney-owned resorts. You know, you yeah. get all the benefits and things like that. But the Disney theming, the Disney service, the Disney experience doesn't stop when you exit the park. It doesn't only begin yep. when you enter the parks. It's through that entire property, even if you're on the golf courses, if you're at the water parks, if you're at Disney Springs or any of the resorts, you're going to experience that same kind of level of theming. You're going to have a truly cool time. And I completely agree with Hank. If you've got a few hours to spend and you want to do something Disney, Disney Springs has really opened that up for so many people. It's unlike any other place you're going to go to in the world. And you can also experience something like the monorail, the monorail loop, which is something you're not going to experience anywhere else as well. One point, Hank, that I do want to mention is if you are on a business trip and it's conference related, even if you're not... Even if your conference isn't at Disney World, I would right. check with the people putting on the conference. I would check with the hotel you're staying at because Disney does offer conference theme park tickets, which is basically yeah. a half-day ticket. Um, hmm. Yeah, so they're they're cheaper, but it's Disney's selective about who they offer that to. They don't advertise it anywhere. You kind of have to seek them out. Yeah, there you go. That's a fun little take-home fact. Connor, I just thought about this while we were talking there. Much like the calendar rolls over into the new year and you still write 2018 on all your checks right now, probably still doing that a little bit, Yeah. where you don't just quite get the hang of it, has the year finally clicked over? Do you not default to um, downtown Disney anymore? I feel like it's Disney Springs. I don't make that mistake very often anymore, almost at all. I will always try to refer to... Hollywood Studios as MGM because I still I trip up on that every time. But I've, I've I don't trip up Disney on Disney that. Springs. I, it is a conscious effort I have I have tuned my brain to do. The <laughs> reason being is because when they changed Hollywood Studio MGM Studios to Hollywood Studios, <laughs> there wasn't any other change. Like it just like eventually we're going to close some stuff. Eventually some other stuff is going to come, but there wasn't any other change. It was just one word. Disney Springs is no longer downtown Disney in more than just yeah. name only. So I think that's yeah. why I try to say Disney Springs like consciously. Yeah. I mean, you know. Look at those garages, man. For me, though, it was difficult because Disney Springs had just opened when I started working front desk at the Yacht and Beach Club. So, yeah. like, I was required to say Disney Springs. Oh, so, yeah, you had to yeah. trial by fire. Yeah, yeah basically. I'm getting used to it, though. But I've, I've noticed that now that I never, you know, accidentally say Downtown Disney anymore. No, no, no. It doesn't help that da it's still called Downtown Disney in Anaheim, though, in Disneyland. Because yeah. every once well, in a while. You've got, you got a different one now. Every once in a while, I'll see an article headline. It'll be like, Downtown Disney to close da da, -da store. And I'll hop, I'll hop on to, like, Yell at them like it's not called. Oh wait, it's in Anaheim. Never mind. Yeah. Never mind. You show them one day, Connor. What do you do? One day, I think if you have one day to go to the theme parks, if you have that one day in Walt Disney World, it's got to be going to Magic Kingdom for as long as possible, right? Right. Yeah. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, that's that is Disney World to a lot of people is showing up to Magic Kingdom. It's the castle. It's there's so many elements to it, Connor. It's the transportation to get there. It's the lagoon, and then it's everything else inside of it. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's what's I mean, for God's sakes, Walt Disney World's logo is the castle itself. You know. Yeah. It's the central theme park. It is the hub. Um. No pun intended on that. It is 
what you need to experience first. Um, I do. I, it does stress me out sometimes that one day visits tend to be around like a holiday. Yeah. And holidays at Magic Kingdom are particularly particularly rough in the parks. Yeah. I mean, it, it is it is crowded there, and that's. Something that we didn't used to have to fear about sending someone to Disney World quite as much, but in the past two, three years, <sighs> Magic Kingdoms is just going to be really crowded, you know, unless you're there for a special event now. And that, it pains me to say that, but that's where that one day thing kind of makes me feel uncomfortable just because I'm like, I wish you could experience a little bit more of this property where it's not so crowded. Like, yeah, I'm going to uh, Daytona for 4th of July, thinking about going to the park for one day. I uh, can't recommend that. No. I can't recommend yeah. that. Right. But it is, if you have one day and... and yeah, you have to do it, though. May, yeah. Maybe that is something where, you know, you're doing a beach trip throughout the year, and, and that's more affordable, but you can only budget or you can only plan for one day going to Disney World... I would say that one day should be Magic Kingdom. That one day ticket's going to be pretty expensive. So that's why I say go for as long as possible. Yeah. If you do want to add on a park hopper, that's going to be a big, you know, cost uh, enhancement. Especially if you got a bigger family. Yeah. If you've got a bigger family, even if you're by yourself, you know. But if you do get that park hopper, then I would say go to Epcot. Um, yeah. Magic Kingdom and Epcot. Mostly because when it comes to transportation, it's more bang for your buck. You get on the yeah. monorail, you get there quick, uh, quick-ish. They're you know close in the grand scheme of yeah. things, but when it's one hey, day, time is of the essence. Hey, let's face the facts. A lot of the people that listen to this podcast um, or that look for that seek out these types of podcasts are experienced Disney fans. So we, I know we have a lot of them that listen too. I, as far as the four parks one day challenge, Aaron, as you know, Aaron and I, my wife did that earlier this year. And we really, really did love it. Earlier last summer, year, bro. Turn the calendar. See, look, I just did it after we had a whole mini whole segment discussion. on the damn thing, right? <laughs> Wake up, man. So, yeah, we spent the whole day at Downtown Disney. <laughs> <laughs> had um, a great time before we headed to MGM Studios. <laughs> MGM Studios Followed tour. by our stay at Dixie Landings. And then yeah, we went to River boy. Country. Okay. All right. That wrapped it up. No, so... We we really did have a fun time. I think that um, you got to do the, the four parks one day challenge is not. And I don't I don't like calling it a challenge. We just had a good day in all four parks, um, but it worked because uh, we had extra hours at a park that was showcasing a new land, and it was the summertime, so there were extended park hours at night. So we went pretty damn late the days that we were there. And if you look at the the park hours in the winter time, if you try to go to all four parks in a day, you're really not. I mean, you're going to be moving way too quick. So try it at some point in your life. I, I really can't recommend it enough, but uh, you don't need to overextend. If it's a if it's your first time, try to fully immerse yourself in Magic Kingdom for that yeah. one day. Um, and then if you decide, hey, I got two days to do Disney World. What am I doing? Still, you got to go for Magic Kingdom for one day. And then it's really up to you that second day. Um, right. I said to do, if you had a park hopper for one day, do Magic Kingdom at Epcot. The reason being is if you get there at, at Magic Kingdom at Rope Drop, you know, basically an hour before the park opens, you can knock out a lot of attractions. You can leave by the 3 o'clock parade. And then you can do a lot of Epcot at night. Um, and that's really mm -hmm. where that park yeah. shines. But here with that second day, maybe it's not, you don't want to spend the entire day at Epcot. Maybe you'd rather do, um, you know, a Hollywood Studios because your kid really wants to see uh, this. They really like adventure rides. They really like big thrill rides. Once mm -hmm. Star Wars opens, maybe it's that. Maybe you hey, Star Wars. That might be one of the one day parks in the coming years. Maybe you're 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 a top notch uh, Cameron file. You're a big James Cameron fan. You got to see Pandora. <laughs> you know we. We are Cameronites, you know. I'm one of you. You got to go to Animal Kingdom. So it's completely up to you. If you do um, split it up uh, and you select a uh, park hopper option for those two days. So the way park hopper works is um, 
you basically have to have it for the length of your stay. You can't just add it on unless you buy yeah. separate tickets, and I don't recommend doing that. That's That'll get very, very messy. I would go to Magic Kingdom, then like Hollywood Studios the first day, mm-hmm. and then the second day I would do Animal Kingdom in the morning, Epcot at night. Um, and that's just because you're able to get a lot more out of it. And you can kind of switch up those other three yeah. to whatever you want, but it's breaking it up, um, you know. Connor, you and I have gone several times under a two-day park hopper ticket together, and we've done we've done the two parks each day type of thing. And we've always had a pretty good time. I feel like that's definitely been a sweet spot at our age and our state of like going to Disney World, the way that we just rip through it. I, I feel like... Um, for the past a novice or someone that's ready to move quickly in an early stage, doing that as two parks in the, in two days is, is definitely feasible. It's definitely something that can be achieved. Yeah. And again, you're not going to see and do it all. Um, far from it with this, this itinerary and this plan, but you're going to be able to experience a lot of stuff and you're going to have a lot of fun in those, those two days. Um, moving on to three days, you know, Magic Kingdom will still get a day. I think Epcot will get a day because wow. what yeah. Epcot offers for me is, um, especially when there's like a festival going on or stuff, yep. it offers you the opportunity to go um, to the parks in the morning, go back, and then come back at night for food, for fireworks, for fun like that. I think that's nice because... It is a vacation. And, you know, if it's something where you're not a go, go, go kind of person, you need some relaxing, I think that's mm-hmm. what Epcot really offers. You can spread it out and it can be great where Animal Kingdom is not a half day park. Hollywood Studios is, you know, transitioning back into a full day park. Um, but it's really up to you. Uh, when it comes to picking what you want to do the next day. Yeah, Hollywood Studios on its way back to a full day park. Not quite there yet, yeah, folks. We're we're getting there. Well, hey, 2019 though, for real. That is that is a thing that's happening this year. I am adamant in the camp that I can't. I know Connor is a big Hollywood Studios fan, and I do like Love it. a lot of that old Hollywood. But um, I'm very adamant that I I can't recommend going there for more than half a day right now, just based on the amount of stuff that's open. There's a lot to appreciate. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Yeah. But um, we're, we're going to get to uh, a major, major land later in 2019 and a, f- a pretty, a fairly large attraction as well. Oh, yeah. So this park is about to sing. Yeah, Lady McQueen's uh, Racer uh, Academy, right? Uh, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. True, true, true. Yeah, I, I meant Dancing with Frozen. But, you know. Oh, gosh. That, that's awesome. Uh, I think three days is really when you can start to add on other features as well, like maybe taking a trip to Disney Springs, like maybe doing some park uh, or some resort hoppings, something like that. Yes. And then I think, Connor, I'd like to add in here too, um, when you start, to, we're at the threshold of three days, and I think it's important to talk a little bit about um, where you're staying on property too. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I think you start to approach that three-day mark, it's no longer – your resort is no longer a place that's just a bed at that point. Yeah. Maybe it still is. Maybe you're still doing a lot during the day at those times. But this is the point in your trip where you need to, as a trip planner, start to evaluate, you know what? I'm going to have my stuff totally unpacked for three days. There's going to be some downtime in the room. I'm going to be back and forth to a lot of different parks multiple times for three days. I need to think about where I am on property. I got to think about what I want to do when I'm at the room. And is this somewhere that I'm comfortable spending three days? Absolutely. And I think it's one of those things where people don't often realize it. And they say, oh, I just need a bed. I just need a bed. That's great. But where you're staying a lot of the times reflects the trip you're going to have. My family is Disney Vacation Club people. I'm an annual pass holder. I'm in a very small minority of people like that. There's still quite a lot of us that that are Disney fans like that. But I know that if we're able to stay at Saratoga Springs, I'm going to be spending a lot of time at Disney Springs. I know if I'm staying at the Beach Club or the Boardwalk, I'm going to probably spend a lot of time at Epcot and at Hollywood Studios, where if I stay in Bay Lake Tower... It's going to be Magic Kingdom going in there every single night. My mom and I going to Magic Kingdom before my dad and my sister wake up. So in that regard, it's about how you're going to get to places as efficiently as possible, like Hank is saying. 
Yep. And I definitely agree. And I think the three day time period is really a threshold when we talk about the park hopper. So I think if you want to experience a lot and you're willing to pay that premium on a one day, you can get a park hopper on two days. If you want to experience all four parks, definitely go for the park hopper sweet value there yes. but i think the middle days of three four and five days they're not really beneficial when it comes to park hopping because it's a lot of money spread over five days for each person in your park and at this point three four and five you don't really have to pick and choose which park on which day with three days, if you don't have a park hopper, you're going to be missing out on one one park. That's fine. With four days, you'll be able to go to a theme park a day. You don't need it. With a fifth day, that's when you're able to do something like a resort day or go to a theme park that day um, for like a second time or, or what yeah. have you. And that's when you really, when you, when you talk about day five, that's when you really got to start thinking about Oh man, what what kind of, what's the slide look like in the pool? Exactly on the property. Exactly. Yeah, because if four days you're going to a park each day, and then you know on those smaller days where you might not experience a whole day in Hollywood Studios or Animal Kingdom or Epcot, you throw in some Disney Springs time. That fifth day is when you're like, what do I want to do with this? I call it a bonus day. You've knocked out all the parks. Ooh. Do you want to spend a full day at Disney Springs? Do you want to spend a full day just relaxing by the pool like Hank is saying? Maybe it's a combination. Maybe it's a, hey, let's do this in the morning. We'll do a big pool day, and then we'll park hop somewhere else at night. Right. That's the real benefit of five days. Um, I think five days is, is, a, is a really, really good amount of time to go. Yeah. I know when I was growing up, whenever we would go basically – we would go once every other year. So we would try to go for five days. Reason being is it was a long time. It was a lot of time to be taken out of school for my mom and dad to miss work and stuff, but we were able to knock out a lot and we would only go every other year. As we started yeah. going more and more frequently, it became three days here, four days here, two days here, what have you, with the expectation that we're going to be back. If you're not going to be back in the foreseeable future if you think this is your one and done trip i would say five days and up is probably good four days and up you can get away with it as well any yep. of these dates you can really get away with it as um but i think those are where you're going to get a lot of bang for your buck because six and yeah, seven I'd... days is where you can really do whatever you want yeah and that's where when you start to say the words like you know whatever you want type of thing that's and we already hinted at this but we it's not we have to stress it more is you really kind of want to pick what park you want to be close to that's when you need to start looking at that i'm going to be here for five six seven days i don't want to be stranded out in the middle of nowhere unless it's with a view of the savannah and i'm looking out at giraffe seating what resort you're Uh, staying at yeah (laughs) yeah Yeah, what resort you're staying at i was referencing animal kingdom lodge which is way out there exactly not within walking distance of any park or any type of attractions but you're on a true retreat out there where if you go to your bedroom window you've got a chance to see something pretty cool if you've got a savannah room or view room in that property but all these other ones you really got to think about you know i want to walk to dinner in epcot i want to take a boat ride at night and look at the magic kingdom as i ride up at nighttime and you know go through a stroll at the park uh through the late hours catch the fireworks or like you're saying i'm a foodie i'm a nightlife type of person i want to be close to disney springs i want to be able to take that boat over there and walk through it really changes your trip at that point and when you get to these days of, of these time frames of six and seven days, keep in mind that the real cost is going to be an additional night in the hotel. The more yeah. days you stay at Disney World, the price of the tickets go down. The reason being is they want to keep you on there so that you keep spending money on their food, on their merch, <laughs> stuff like that. Right. So ticket prices, you know, one day is set in stone, but if it one day is $105, you can get um two a two day pass for like ninety five dollars a day. Yeah. Three is less, four or five, you know, stuff like that. And then the park hopper adds on to that as well. Yeah, don't and don't forget too, when you're when you're looking at these days that are five, six, seven down there, there's absolutely no reason you can't make a, a grocery run 
early on to, to, to load up on snacks and water bottles, uh, drinks for your room, that type of thing. Um, definitely worth your time when you're down there that much. If you're thinking, gosh, I just can't imagine eating out or, you know, having every single snack or drink or water bottle that I want to be at Disney price, you can, you can accommodate that to, to alleviate some cost at that point. There's a couple of services you can use. Um, Amazon Prime now has Prime Now in Orlando. So you can, you know, order food directly to your hotel. If you're an Amazon Prime member, that's a great benefit. Very good. But yeah. Garden Grocer, gardengrocer.com, they're basically specialize in, you know, sending uh, groceries to uh, Disney uh, hotels and things like that. There's an order form online. Great it's very option, simple. Yeah simple to use we used to get orders at yacht beach club all the time um so that's a great way to to be cost effective uh i will say this as well when we're talking about um the shorter time frames of like three or four days what my family has started doing is that day that we get there taking the earliest flight from here in dc down to florida that's easier to do on the east coast than it is from you know, LA or something, you can hop on the red eye. Yes, it's going to suck. You're going to get up wicked early. You're going to be really tired. But what you get out of that is almost a full extra day when you land. If you land at like, you know, if you have a 630 flight, we land at 830. We're at a resort. We're in a park by like 10, something like that. We're able to do a lot um, more with that day because the Flights of like the noon, one, two o'clock, two p.m. flights, those just kind of wipe out your entire day once you get yep. to the resort. Um, so that's an added benefit to do it. Connor, what's your so now? As we said, it was too tough to say before. What's your like right now at your age, your place in your career and your love life? Um, how? What's your <laughs> ideal length of a vacation? Love life. That's <laughs> good. That's good. I love a four day trip because I'm still kind of paranoid about still being early in my career, like leaving for a long time. Um, yeah. they'll let me do that. No problem. But it's just kind of a, it's just something new to me. Like, like, yeah, we're not, we're not quite the two week vacationers yet, unless you take a honeymoon, which I did do that. I'm going to say four days. And I think I would recommend that I would start with the premise of you're going to go for four days whether that first day is a 6 a.m. flight down there, whether it's you get there the day before and then you're spending four days there, or if it's a late flight out the final day, start with four days, plan a trip around that, and then see we can only really swing three days, we can only swing two, hey, we can go up to five, maybe we can even go to six. I would say zone yeah. in on that four days because that's when you're able to give up each park its consideration. And then from there, you can decide what are your must do's versus what are your nice to do's. Oh, no, you didn't. Stacy with the Stacey. must do's. Thank you, Stacy. Every resort room's favorite show. Oh, yeah. Time to do the must do's. Hank, the must do's. what do you think day- days wise? I, you know, I'm all over the place right now, but I think for me, I, we have really, so I have to answer it, you know, kind of with what I've displayed over the past few years, like taking new groups of people, like bringing people that have never been before and like um, accommodating a lot of schedules. That's another thing you got to take into account is accommodating a lot of schedules of, you know, people are similar to our age, you know, early in career type of thing. So that sweet spot for us has kind of been three days. Uh, three days feels quick, um, especially when you're going off property to Universal because a lot of people want to see that for the first time. But um, it just allows you to to taste that you know little bit of Disney uh, where, wherever you want in the year. You can jam it in. You don't have to plan out like you're saying to take a whole week off type of thing. You can kind of cram it in quickly, put it at a time of year where it might be a lower season. Um, and still, like you're you're saying, we're able to touch every park that way when you've got the three days, unless you do the one park each day type of thing, which has been no problem with uh, Hollywood Studios um, being a half-day park for me. But um, yeah, I, th- I think – you go ahead. I think it's – we've taken plenty of new timers there for the first time for three days, and we've really got them hooked on that. Um, yeah. So I think that speaks volumes for that time frame of three days. I am – after uh, you know several years now of really 
Yep, I can come down for a day. Oh, we have time for a day there. Yes, let's do a two-day weekend. Three-day weekend for these folks. That's the longest we can do. Um, I'm I'm really ready. I'm rearing to go for like four or five days. Yep, I'm right I there. Really with you, wanna, man. I really want to go down there and enjoy um, the parks a little bit more. And then here we are even before we started recording tonight. Oh, yeah, I might come down for a day or two and see you, Connor. Exactly. In April. It's easy. It's easy um, to do that. But I, I'm – Starting to circle. I don't know where it'll fall on that calendar, but yes, Connor, my I want that four or five day vacation. It's where you're able to relax a little more, you know, yeah. kind of take it, take it a little easier. Not yeah. so much get up and go, 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 which I love doing. Uh, it's exhausting, but I love doing that as well. Yeah. Um, so there you go. I think we're kind of in the three or four days. If it's you just want to get your feet wet. Obviously, for me, the more days, the better at Walt Disney World. But of course, budgets, things like that, er, they get in the way of all that stuff. Um, yeah. So let us know what you think. What is the perfect number of days for your Walt Disney World stay? Email your answers to us, Connor, C-O-N-O-R, at WDWOpinion.com. Send any questions you have to us as well. We'll be doing a listener question show in a couple of weeks, so we look forward to answering your questions on the air. But for now, that's going to do it for us this week. As always, thank you so very much for listening to the show. Be sure to rate and review us on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And share the show with someone you think might enjoy it. If you liked what you heard today, then you've been listening to the WDW Opinion Podcast. If by chance you didn't like what you heard, then you've been listening to the Ron Burgundy Podcast. For Hank... I'm Connor. We'll see you real soon.